These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. With today's topic, we leave the realm of what could have been considered domestic industries. Though there was factory-scale production of beer and textiles and many other crafted goods, many and likely the majority of all crafted goods were created at home. When we get into the realm of metals, however, things change dramatically. There have been some who say that it required large-scale societies and the governments that come with them to make metalworking possible. There's others who say that it was the need for larger-scale metalworking that drove the formation of large-scale societies and governments. I personally think that the impact of metalworking on society was not quite so direct as all that, though certainly the indirect effects of metal in Bronze Age society were nothing to be sneered at. That said, for various reasons, metal, the metalworking process is much harder to relate to the everyday lives of ancient Mesopotamians and Near Easterners more broadly. For example, I'd wanted to start out today's story with a tale of some miner in Anatolia or Cyprus pulling the, the metal right out of the rocks. But after a lot of research, it turns out that there's remarkably little that we can say for sure, not just about how the metals were mined, but also the conditions of the miners. Even whether they were likely slave or free men is actually really unclear. Uh, and some people think it's obvious that they were all slaves. Some think people think it's obvious that they were all free. Uh, and it may have been both in the same mine. It may have been some in one place and some in the other. We really don't know. We don't know if they were extremely poor, these miners, or if they were laborers able to support a family on their mining income. I mean, they definitely weren't rich, whatever the case, but... The study of ancient metal and ancient metal working is unfortunately extremely dry and has a lot, a lot of gaps in just what we know. And this isn't like the gaps that we have in ancient uh, cooking knowledge or our ancient uh, textile knowledge. These are gaps despite a lot of intense research effort. And we just can't find it for whatever reason. We can't find all the answers. I'm going to do what I can to improve matters, but instead today of following some person or following A or B anymore and his family, like the last couple episodes, we're going to just have a pretty straightforward overview of how ancient Mesopotamians went from copper in the ground to a bronze axe on the battlefield. The story of ancient Mesopotamian mining, though, never begins in Mesopotamia. The land between the rivers is almost completely devoid of useful metals, and everything worked was imported originally from somewhere else. That somewhere else encompasses pretty much every neighbor, from the Caucasus Mountains, to Anatolia, to Canaan, to Cyprus, to Egypt, to the mountains of Iran over in the east, possibly as far away as modern Afghanistan, and through ocean trade even to Bahrain, Oman, and distant India. Everywhere the Mesopotamians interacted with was, at various points, a source of metals. But it is, in its own way, Fascinating that this ancient early culture managed to build a major central industry based completely on imports. Over time, there was enough worked metal in circulation that melting the old items down and reusing them was a major supply source competing directly with imported metals. But it does help to explain the pattern that we so often see where disruptions to international trade really affects the prosperity of ancient Mesopotamia far more than we might expect, given the relatively limited volumes of trade. Now, I do use the word limited volume. I mean that in a modern sense, in an absolute sense. But we do have records of single shipments brought in from Oman of copper weighing 18 tons. 
In the north, at the same time, no individual donkey could carry that much, but trade missions crisscrossed the Near East almost ceaselessly, except in times of the greatest crisis. Tons and tons of various metals made their way around the ancient world, enough to define an entire era as a Bronze Age. And yet we should always keep in mind that these metals were never cheap in this era, and bronze in particular was quite valuable, which also explains why so much was melted and reforged, which in turn explains why it's so hard to find a lot of archaeological evidence for some of this stuff, because all that was super useful throughout the centuries and would be taken and reused and reforged into a later archaeological contexts, leaving nothing on the ground for us to discover nowadays. The quantities of metal involved were great enough for the great kings to do just whatever they wanted in metal. Put, put it in palaces, build huge armies, build huge statues with metal, but the prices were also high enough that an ordinary family likely owned no bronze at all. And if they could afford any copper implements, the metal part would usually be relatively small. And these few copper implements, maybe, maybe, maybe one bronze, would be a treasured household item taken very good care of, even though they're usually working tools. And so with that bit of context in mind, let's start by examining the materials mined and how they were obtained. With the evidence so scarce and none of the mining taking place in Mesopotamia, we're forced to rely heavily on archaeology as well as on analogy to mining all over the world from Europe to China to supplement our sparse knowledge. And we're forced to generalize about mining in general. Uh, when we are talking about a process being developed all the way from Egypt to Anatolia to Afghanistan, we're combining things because we don't have a full picture in any one of these places. And even if we mix them all into one picture, it's still got a lot of holes. But with that in mind, the first thing mined was, it turns out, not metal at all, but flint. Now, quite a lot of flint can be just found on the ground. You can pick it up, you can nap the flint. It starts with a K, K-N-A-P, nap to the flint, which means that it's struck in a particular way to carefully break off pieces and shape an edge. Now, flint is interesting for an ancient person because it can get a pretty nasty edge on it, and you can cut yourself pretty good on a piece of flint, even if it's unworked. And then if you nap it just a little bit, you've got a nice primitive knife or axe or whatever you need. Flint, in fact, would be so useful in knives and other sorts of blades that it's going to be in common use throughout the Bronze Age as the poor man's knife or sickle. But well before history, it's easy to see how early man could have picked up this rock and realized how sharp it could be, and began to keep an eye out for this particular rock in a systematic fashion. Then, around 24,000 years ago, Stone Age people began to realize that places where you could pick up flint laying on the ground often had more flint buried in the ground itself. And by using bone and stone hammers, they could crush the rock beneath their flint and go down to get more flint. This was extremely labor-intensive and not often done in the Stone Age, but it was the birth of mining. Now, it's debated whether gold or copper was the first actual metal to be discovered, with dates for both around 8000 BCE, but there are some who put each a bit later. Both, however, are distinctive in that they can be easily seen on surface deposits, and they're pretty attention-catching, and they require very little processing to use effectively. Gold has the particular advantages that there are places around the world where it can be found in the rivers, with no mining necessary. And it does seem that the earliest Egyptian gold was all alluvial. None was mined at all in the prehistoric era the early prehistoric era. I think mining does start before writing 
in Egypt. The thing about gold, though, is that you can't really use it for very much. You can make nice jewelry, but the later uses of gold in currency and, of course, later in electronics are both a long way away. That said, once civilization does start to really get going, which is to say once people with armies are able to force people to give them loads of stuff, gold ornamentation becomes more popular. And there's now both an incentive and a labor pool to start digging in the earth for gold. Except in the Near East, what they're digging for is rarely actual gold, but rather electrum. And for those unfamiliar with metals, this is a common theme. Metal mining is not like Minecraft, where you come across a chunk of colored rock, you hit it a couple times, and out comes the desired metal. Nearly all metals on the Earth exist in mineral forms, not as pure metals, and are sometimes quite different in the ground than the final product in terms of appearance and quality. With gold, though, the principal form it's found in in the mines is a mineral called electrum, which is a mix of mostly gold and silver, which sometimes has a few other nice metals in there as well. For the early period, pretty much all of this comes from Egypt, and most of that from a specific region about halfway up the Nile called the Wadi Hammamat. There are ways to separate the gold from the silver, but it's likely that these weren't known about until the Greek era, and generally it seems that the Mesopotamians, at least, simply can't tell Electrum from actual gold. In the written sources, especially in the Amarna letters most famously, we get some kings talking about high and low quality gold. So the folks at the top may have had some idea, but archaeologically, we find gold items with anywhere from 40 to 100 percent gold in them all over the place. If we're talking about gold, though, we should also talk about silver. Some proportion of what is called silver in the ancient world is actually electrum, though electrum with a very high percentage of silver and a low percentage of gold, enough that it's characteristically silver in color. The more common source of silver, though, is as a byproduct of mining lead. Now, you stick some lead in a hot furnace, around 1,000 degrees Celsius, and it'll melt both the lead and the silver. If you do this melting inside of a special bowl called a cupole, made out of a special material like bone ash, or there's a lot of proposed materials that can be used for it, the cupole will absorb the lead and let the pure silver drop out. The process was likely repeated a few times because ancient furnaces did not typically get high and, more importantly, consistent heat levels, so each time it would be only partially refined. The end result, though, was that most of the silver in the ancient Near East, where it hasn't been intentionally debased, was remarkably pure because it came from this super pure lead purification technique thingy. The silver and the lead mostly comes from Anatolia in this time period, and the great silver mines of the region were what attracted both traders and conquerors throughout the Bronze Age. Sargon of Akkad notes that the western limits of his conquests were the land of the Cedars in Lebanon and the Silver Mountains in Anatolia. Of course, silver is no more useful than gold in a practical sense, but it was more common. And during the Babylonian period, when there, while there's no currency as we would understand it now, a shekel of silver was a common way to denominate all manner of goods and taxes and offerings. This was the case even when no actual silver was being exchanged. People would just use the common value of things relative to silver to ensure that they're getting a fair deal when bartering other goods. Like maybe you're selling wood for grain, but you're thinking about, I have one silver shekel worth of wool, I have one silver shekel worth of grain. These are two different quantities compared to this consistent weight of silver. The thing about silver, though, is that 
a whole ton, like an actual metric ton of lead ore contains only a few ounces of silver. And for the first 3,000 years of lead working in Anatolia, there's no evidence of any silver production until around 4,000 BCE when the cupel technique, the cupellation technique, was discovered. This raises the question of whether there were other sources of silver or if there was just an absolute ton of lead in the ancient world. Modern scholarship does seem to say that both of these possibilities are likely part of the story, though we don't, we don't know in too much detail. Now, whether lead or copper was first identified as the first useful metal is debated, but lead pretty clearly had a presence in Anatolia around 7,000 BCE, or only a millennium or so after the famous Gobekli Tepe structure was abandoned. Lead does require smelting, unlike gold, but the temperature at which it can be smelted and melted and worked is relatively low, and any civilization able to make pottery can already generate enough heat to work lead though that silver smelting bit does require a bit extra, which may have been part of why it wasn't isolated until a few thousand years later. In the early period, it seems they experimented with using lead for just about everything. Eventually, though, they realized it wasn't great for tools. It really wasn't optimal for anything substantial. Its great virtue is that it's quite heavy, and it's often used as weights, as filler, as the insides of statues that would be plated outside with better metals, and for very cheap metal items that richer people would have in bronze instead. Lead vessels for holding food and drink were extremely common, and I can find no discussion at all of how much that lead might have leaked into the food, so I can't really comment on the safety of that. Also, lead was very popular for small items like pins and needles, and could be cast very easily into a variety of shapes, both ornamental and useful. Uh, these, these lead needles, uh, if you'll recall last episode, I did mention that the kaunikas and the various wraps that the Mesopotamians liked to wear, they would have had to be held on somehow. And if they weren't being tied, it was these lead pins that were probably holding them together. We just don't find a lot of lead pins that are very clearly for clothes. Like you find a pin... What's it for? I mean, it's for pinning anything you want in the whole world. So that's the source of that bit of confusion. Maybe someone will figure it out someday. Still, even though lead was common, it wasn't societally or technologically transformative in the way that copper and bronze were. And pretty much anything that can be done in lead can usually be done by other materials and often either cheaper or better. Not always even um, other metals. Like if you have a pot, you'd rather I would rather have a clay pot than a lead pot. I mean, for the health reasons, of course. But unless you really want a really, really heavy pot, then you want a clay pot. If you want a fancy pot, you want a copper pot. You don't want a lead pot. But there were lead pots. So that's why there was so much lead. It was available. And in the Bronze Age, sometimes you didn't do what you wanted, you just did what was available. And all that gets us to the star of our show, at least for the Bronze Age, copper and tin. Bronze, for those who don't know, is not a pure metal. It is an alloy, which means a combination of two different metals, copper and tin. The ideal ratio for bronze is about 90% copper to 10% tin, though they often didn't reach this ideal ratio, sometimes due to manufacturing defects, but it's more commonly thought that if you weren't at that 90% that 10% ratio, it was probably to save money on the more expensive tin. Uh, and when they did, though, the results made for a harder, stronger tool or weapon than could even be made from raw iron. 
and contrary to popular belief, iron was known about during much of the Bronze Age, as modern scholarship is increasingly making clear. But we'll save discussion for iron for the end of the episode. For now, bronze begins with copper. Mesopotamia has no copper, indeed, as we said, almost no metals at all, but it is surrounded by places that do have it. In the north, there's a great geological band that runs from Anatolia through Armenia into the Iranian mountains with copper deposits all along the length there. In the distant west, the island of Cyprus is so famous for copper that the two became synonymous. And far to the south, in Oman, there were massive copper mines that were simple enough to reach by ship that we see shipments of 15 to 20 tons coming in regularly, at least in the periods where that Oman to Mesopotamia trade route was open. And the great thing about metal is that it's almost endlessly recyclable. And so, well before the invention of writing, Sumerian civilization had brought so much copper into Mesopotamia that even when trade did fail, there was always the option to melt down existing copper items and reforge them with minimal loss, especially when you consider that these periods with less trade are usually periods with more conquering and plundering of other cities, so you plunder some guy some guy's house and he's got a couple copper tools well i've already got some copper tools i just take his i melt them down i make something even better it's great minimal loss except to the guy being plundered and it's his fault for losing the war and so in a place with no native metals we see one of the first great metal working centers in human history thanks to trade and just being really generally clever. Now, exactly who mined the copper is not clear. And in many ways, like I said, the mining process for most things is obscure to us. The general consensus is that mining was really unpleasant, and so it was done by slaves. Hard labor in general, though, was recognized as both difficult and valuable. And so there's no, no kings going around breaking rocks, of course, but we know that hard laborers were often given higher rations, including more servings of meat, uh, as many as two to three servings of meat in a week, which for the ancient world was pretty posh. And so it could be that it was viewed as a difficult, low-status, but high-paying job, much like nowadays forestry or oil field roughnecking or in, indeed the mining industry in modern times. You make all right money doing these things today. Slave or free, though, these miners are not the emaciated semi-corpses we usually imagine. It takes a substantial baseline of strength just to do this work. I mean, even, even considering all of what they do in the Bronze Age, this is, this is tough work. And it re with the required diet and the hard labor, these men would have been physically quite imposing. Of course, the work will also have taken a toll on the body as well. And they would have been worn out and used up on a regular basis. They probably would have aged much faster than even their hard-living Bronze Age fellows out in the agricultural fields. It's not fun. There was a great deal of craft involved in the business of operating a mine. But from what ancient accounts we do have, are there often long after the Mesopotamian age has ended, but we do have some reasons to think that even like these later Roman accounts, somewhat reflect certain parts of what a Mesopotamian mine, or no Mesopotamian mines, but what a uh, early Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age mine might, might have looked like. Uh, it seems, though, that the knowledge required to do mining was contained in one or a handful of overseers, these men who could read the rocks and tell people where to dig, how to shore up overhangs, and generally just what to do. Mining would have begun always as a surface mine. 
the characteristic blue-green hue of oxidized copper ore is distinctive enough to attract attention. But once the deposit was located, both open quarries and shafts as deep as 100 feet are known, though most would have been much shallower. There was no systematic understanding of rocks in the way that modern geologists understand things such as the nature and origins of all the rocks, the chemical makeup, uh, would have been more like the color. Rocks were largely classified and understood by their practical purposes, such as rocks good for making mortars and pestles, rocks good for making stone bowls, and they were also categorized by their location of origin, such as rocks from the Eastern Mountains or rocks from Dilmun and Magan. Still, we must assume that the overseer had a certain amount of geological understanding, even if it wasn't formalized. He must have been really busy, though, because he likely saw, oversaw a good number of men on even a modest-sized mine, plus a number of support staff to keep the miners fed, the materials all transported, and whatever auxiliary tasks were required. The men themselves, though, need not have known hardly anything about their task. The overseer would point to a region of rock, and they would spend the rest of the day smashing it with rock or bronze hammers. There were no picks, even much later on. Instead, they simply uh, took a good solid rock and tied it to a good solid stick and smashed it on the rock around what needed to be extracted until both the hammer and target were pulverized. You can imagine that this went through a large number of tools, though at least the copper and bronze tools could be melted down and reforged on site. But consider that even 100 years ago, the British miners who still primarily used steel pickaxes would have gone through 10 or so pickaxes every single day. So this sort of tool consumption appears to be pretty standard throughout mining. It seems to have happened fairly regularly that miners would encounter a rock substantially harder than their tools. When possible, miners would dig around the hardest rock, but when necessary, a small furnace would be constructed in front of the hard point, and the whole area would be heated to a few hundred degrees Celsius, which could often weaken the rock either by softening it or making it prone to shattering, allowing it to be worked with great effort by the miners and their hammers. Once the copper ore is extracted, a hauler carries away, carries away a chunk of mixed copper and rock to the processing area at the top of the mine. Inside a mud brick furnace, a layer of wood is placed on the ground, then a layer of ore, then another layer of wood, then another layer of ore, up and up for a few sandwich layers like this. Using mostly straw to get the fire started and keep it going, plus a set of leather bellows, the smelters pump in a constant flow of air to bring the temperature up to about 850 degrees Celsius, and they keep it there rather constantly for 24 hours. At the end of the process, the unneeded stuff had mostly either burnt off or separated, while the copper itself liquefied and fell to the bottom of the furnace. Once it's cool enough to stick your hand in there, the ash would be scooped off and the result would be usable, mostly pure copper. Now, I do say mostly because at 860 degrees, there are a few impurities that will not separate from the copper. What was left in the final product depended a lot on the particular ore that was being smelted. Different geological conditions introduced different impurities. But the most significant impurity was about 4 to 8 percent arsenic, turning regular copper into arsenical copper. Not all copper was arsenical copper, but this was, of all the impurities, the one that was most interesting. It's significant for three reasons. The first is that it has a bunch of arsenic, and whenever it's worked, it's going to release a small amount of that arsenic. Arsenic is 
poisonous, but in the short term, this small amount is unnoticeable. Over the long run, however, it can cause nerve damage, birth defects, and organ failures. We have occasional literary tropes that indicate that people in the Bronze Age, and even into the Iron Age, when arsenical copper was still quite common, noticed that smiths tended to be unhealthy people. Take, for example, the Greek god of the forge, Hephaestus, who was portrayed as lame and likely had his origin as a mythological character in the centuries when arsenical copper was most likely worked. And then you have, if your smith is the son of another smith, then both that, the father and the mother have been hanging around arsenical fumes while they're giving birth to this child, and then he comes out with a leg that's all funny, and, hey, let's call him Hephaestus. That sounds good. Aside from health concerns, though, arsenical copper, when cast into a decorative feature, deposits a large amount of the arsenic on the outside of the item. The casting process is where you uh, melt it completely, pour it into a mold made out of plaster or clay or something with a really high melting point and you like let it settle in and take that shape then you clear the mold out and you got something in a nice fun shape they were casting pretty early in history when you cast it because of how it cools down the arsenic tends to f pool up on the outer part of the item on the edge which greatly enhances the shininess and inhibits rust, making it preferred for decorative pieces. Beyond that, though, true arsenical copper in the 48% arsenic range can, if you work hard in it and anneal it carefully, can be stronger than most bronzes. While we have no indication that a Bronze Age smith knew how to increase or decrease the arsenic content, or had any idea why these particular pieces were better, they did have a subjective understanding that some copper was better than others, and this arsenical copper was preferred whenever it could be identified. Whatever the type of copper, high or low quality, once the slag is recovered, it would be remelted into a mold to create various ingots of various sizes for transport and trade. Now, these are pretty regular rectangular prisms, sometimes with like a signet design stamped onto it to guarantee the quality, though the quality was not, in fact, always guaranteed. And there were a number of ancient scams in which ingots of copper, as well as sometimes gold or bronze or silver or whatever, were made of a core of cheaper material with the high quality stuff on the outside only. If you're familiar with the story of Ea Nasir, I haven't covered him on the show, but he did become an internet meme a few years ago. This was probably the scam he was running during the Old Babylonian period. But we have to assume that the majority of merchants were more or less honest in this trade, since what complaints we do have suggest that scams were the exception, not the rule. Anyway, once the ingot arrives at the smith's workshop, the real work gets started. Note that I am deliberately avoiding the word blacksmith, or at least as best I can. I don't know, maybe I end up, maybe I've already said it somewhere. But the English word blacksmith refers specifically to someone who works with iron. Goldsmiths, coppersmiths, silversmiths, whitesmiths, and at least by later English classification, were mostly what the Bronze Age had to work with, and really none of these categories, which come from the European Middle Ages, really match perfectly with the ancient categories. I could tell you that Napahu is the Akkadian equivalent for a smith, but they had a whole constellation of names for different kinds of metal workers, and linguists aren't always completely certain where the lines are for the different terms. Anyway, we'll call him a smith. It was probably always a he, and he probably learned it from his father. 
An interesting note on that part of it, though, a Smith's father was often, but not always, his biological father. Adoption was not uncommon in ancient Mesopotamia, for a variety of reasons, from charitable adoptions to economic transaction adoptions, but sometimes a family would pay a smith to take in their son so that the boy could learn a valuable trade. In later eras, this might take the form of apprenticeship, but in Mesopotamia, it was often a full adoption. The child would completely enter the smith's household, call the smith father, and be raised as an adopted son, including an adoption contract between the two families. It would be a hard life, but a decently secure one, as close to a middle class as we get in the Bronze Age. Anyway, our smith has his copper, and let's say for now that he's only working with pure copper of some quality. The first step is going to be to melt it down once again. In another forge, quite like the one we saw at the mine, a mud brick cube or rounded bit or they had a bunch of different constructions with a hole in the middle and a hole on the top with bellows to pump in air and raise the temperature. The melted copper will be set to pour itself into a mold, possibly made of clay or lead or maybe with wax shapes in the middle that will create empty pockets once the wax is removed. Casting is not the oldest way of working with copper, heating and pounding it like your classic blacksmith with the hammer ding, ding, ding. That was almost certainly the first technique employed. Still, casting was the most common in the Bronze Age. If our end result is something decorative or something which won't need to do very much work, like a pot or some such, the mold will be removed from the fire once the copper has filled it. It'll be allowed to cool, and then it'll be removed to unveil essentially a finished piece. A more decoration can involve engravings or soldering on decorative elements or similar finishing work, but it's pretty simple work from a technical perspective, requiring mostly patience and artistic skill to apply whatever filing, polishing, carving, or punching is needed. For a copper tool, however, the casting only brings it into roughly the right shape. Indeed, for something like a sword, whose final shape is not too different from a rectangular ingot, the casting may be skipped entirely, though sometimes even rectangular objects can be recast to get them closer to the desired shape. The issue with copper is that when it comes out of a mold, it's kind of soft. Not like gold, where you could just bite into it. Uh, if you didn't know, you can test if you have pure piece of gold by biting and seeing if it leaves a mark. But still, softer than you want in a tool, like an axe or a plow or a hoe. You need the copper to hold its edge for as long as possible to be worth all the effort and expense of making it. Remember, a big part of the expense here is just all this fire in a place that doesn't have a whole lot of flame fuel, relatively speaking. They don't have huge forests to chop down. They got some reeds. They got the leftover chaff from last year. They've got from last year's harvest. They've got poop from the cows in the field. And, I mean, they're really scraping the bottom of the barrel for uh, flame fuel at certain times. These are not great things. And so it's a huge expense just to heat something up for an extended period of time. Fortunately, though, copper has a quality where it can be work hardened. Let's say you have a copper axe head and you hit it with a hammer to make it narrower and sharper down at the business end. If the copper is cold, the metal will resist a bit, but it'll also deform a bit. At the molecular level, copper and certain other work-hardenable metals form something of a lattice. But it's not an ultra-hard crystal lattice. There are weak points in the lattice, at least when it comes right out of the forge. When it's deformed, though, the molecules of the lattice slide around and start to fill in those weak points, those little molecular hollow spots. 
and this makes the metal noticeably stronger and more resistant to further deformation. This is work hardening, and when done right with quality copper, you can make a tool that is sharper, stronger, and holds its edge longer than the same item made from wrought iron. I know I said that before, but I gotta repeat it again, bronze is sharper, even copper can be sharper than iron. It can make better weapons than iron until you get high-tech iron. That's for later, though. Of course, if you take the work hardening too far, it'll get brittle and it'll crack the piece, but this is fine. You just heat it back up to four or five hundred degrees Celsius, enough to soften the metal, but not enough to melt it, and it'll meld right back together, a process called annealing. That annealing will soften out the work hardening too, so that final pass of work hardening is what really makes the difference. But basically, this is how copper tools were made. And weapons. If this is how copper tools were made, this is the, how the majority of all metal items were made in the entire Mesopotamian period, including not just bronze, but also but into the Iron Age until decently late into the Neo-Assyrian period. Bronze, as we'll discuss in a bit, was really expensive, and even if it did have desirable qualities, and iron, as we'll discuss after that, required a lot of technology, even after the start of the so-called Iron Age, to make it better than copper tools. And so we get to bronze. The alloy of copper and tin, which made the Bronze Age so special. We already have our copper ingots in the smithy, but where do we get the tin? Now this, it turns out, is one of the great mysteries of Mesopotamian archaeology. Many different theories have been proposed, because in modern times there's essentially no tin which can be found anywhere between Thailand and northern France. In an early episode of the show, I did mention this and was forced to conclude that there must have been trade routes stretching from Thailand to India to Mesopotamia, or perhaps in the other direction that very early Canaanite traders may have reached all the way to the Atlantic Ocean in their grand adventures. Um, that was very early in the show. Nowadays, I have much better access to more recent materials, and I have found that both of these are no longer considered to have been likely in the Bronze Age. They did have vast and really impressive trade networks, but those were not connected to Western Europe or Southeast Asia. At the same time, as the door is closing on super long distance trade, it is opening on the possibility of deposits much closer to the northwest and northeast. In the northwest, there are some Anatolian specialists who believe they found signs of relatively small tin mines in the Anatolian mountains. These had likely been exhausted already by the Hittite era, but they could point to where the first tin of the Bronze Age was dug up, providing a relatively local supply already tied into regional trade networks that could have given folks the first taste of bronze. In later periods, it's looking increasingly likely that the tin for the Middle East came from modern-day Afghanistan, or possibly one of the other nations nearby, that general uh, Central Asian area. In the early Bronze Age, it would have traveled down to the Indus Valley civilization, then passed on boats to the cities of Sumer and Akkad. In later times, it would have traveled over the perilous Iranian mountains to arrive on donkeys. There are issues with the Afghanistan theory, like why we haven't found signs of what should be a super wealthy civilization surrounding the export of tin. But it's also a region with relatively poor archaeology in general, so there may be good answers to all of our Afghanistan tin questions that just haven't been dug up yet. One other possibility is small amounts of tin in the rivers, probably near gold mines, so in Egypt. The quantities would have been really small, but the alluvial tin would have been relatively easy to work with, and 
could have gotten a tiny early bronze industry up and running, though like the proposed Anatolian source, this alluvial tin would not have sustained a bronze industry for very long. When it comes to mining tin, it's an order of magnitude more difficult than any of the other metals in common use to mine and work with. First of all, it never shows up in metallic form in nature at all. It's always mineralized and doesn't really look very exceptional in the ground. So it's tough to see how they figured out that this particular rock could be dug up and processed and turned into something useful in the first place. But once you have identified a surface deposit somewhere, your next challenge is that tin ores are always found inside granite, an exceptionally hard rock, which would have been a great challenge to mine with nothing but the smash it with rock and bronze hammers method of mining known to antiquity. Once you get past those two hurdles, you have to smelt the ore at temperatures exceeding 1,100 Celsius. These are pretty difficult temperatures to reach in a mud brick oven, with a bunch of smoke to separate out the pure tin from the other stuff. We honestly don't know how they did any of that. But then once you have the tin, the metal that you've worked so hard for, the stuff in your hand is actually kind of lame. If you try and make jewelry out of it, it isn't super shiny. If you try and make tools out of it, it's not going to hold its edge. It's going to break pretty quick. Tin, by itself, isn't really useful for very much. The current theory is that somehow, people figured out that it was useful as a soldering material. You could use it to weld broken bits of copper together at temperatures much lower than would be required to reforge the copper. And indeed, tin still remains a popular soldering material in electronics today. The idea is, at some point people went either on purpose or accidentally from soldering the copper with tin to mixing the two together. When you mix copper and tin, even if you don't get that 10% tin right away, you get bronze of various qualities, which can be cast into something superior to regular copper. Not only does tin harden the resulting metal, it also lowers the melting point and increases the fluidity of molten bronze compared to copper. And oftentimes we see bronzes with as little as 1 to 2 or 3% tin content. Too low to really improve the hardness, but enough to make casting it a little bit easier. It flows better. Ultimately, tin, and by extension bronze, had two main values for the ancient world. First is that nothing made a better cutting edge, generally speaking, than bronze. And also that bronze scales in armor protected better than copper scales without requiring the laborious work hardening process. Second, tin was extremely rare, and bronze was already valuable for the production of high-quality weapons and tools, making bronze a precious metal, visually distinct from other metals, and thus desirable for decorations where the intent was showing off the owner's sheer wealth. Nothing, after all, says wealth quite like, I can waste this rare substance that has huge practical value. As for iron, there's probably more that needs to be said on this topic than I can fill into the remainder of this episode. I say remainder, we're already 48 minutes or something like that. Uh, so I'll get into iron and I'll later I'll find a spot to a full episode, not just on the production of iron, but all the stuff surrounding it um, once we get into the Iron Age. And we'll figure out why it was so transformative that it got a whole era named after it. But the short version, as it applies to the Bronze Age, is this. Archaeologists keep pushing back the date of the first known iron objects. It's solidly confirmed all the way back in the Middle Bronze Age, and there are likely examples going back even further than that. 
Even the Sumerian language had a word for iron. And of course, the Sumerian language was mostly dead except as an academic language by about 1800. Uh, so that puts us pretty far back in time. The oldest sources are widely believed to have come from meteors, which often contain pure metallic iron that's relatively easy to identify, extract, and work. You can easily imagine that both the heavenly origin of this iron, as well as its scarcity, made it a prized treasure. But by the Amarna period, just in the inventories of the Amarna letters, we quickly get the sense that there is a bit too much iron around for it all to be meteoric, unless we posit that like the ancient gods were extremely active in sending down little resource parcels to their earthly worshippers. Probably not. Theories on the first source of iron abound. Some think that the sand of the North Anatolian Black Sea coast, which naturally contains a certain amount of iron, could have been collected and smelted. Some think that there may have been very small, deeply buried deposits of an extremely rare telluric iron, which is iron in its metallic state buried in the ground. Some think that when smelting copper, early smiths may have accidentally grabbed nearby iron ore and produced small qualities of low-quality iron that way. There was, it should be emphasized, no Hittite monopoly on iron. This used to be the theory that the, only the Hittites and then later only the Philistines knew how to make iron. That's not, it's clearly not the case. Um, so the scarcity of iron has to do with the fact that iron ore mining had not yet been invented, and during the Iron Age, only unconventional sources were available. Ultimately, though, iron is geologically plentiful, both around the Middle East and globally. It would almost certainly have been dug up by accident many times in the process of mining other things, stones and metals alike. But the bottom line with iron is that it takes a lot of heat-related technology to make it useful. And one of the more underappreciated aspects of the history of technology is how key a role was played by the maximum temperature that could be reached in a furnace. For example, in the ancient world, it was only the Chinese who were able to reach the high temperatures required for cast iron which is also why they're the only ones in the ancient world able to create porcelain as well, because you need really high temperatures. At lower temperatures, iron can still be worked, but it's much less efficient, and the end product is, as I've said multiple times, typically inferior to bronze. Once the required temperatures were achieved consistently in the centuries following the Bronze Age collapse, there are still three more key techniques needed to make iron superior to bronze. Iron carburization was likely discovered by accident, but quenching and tempering are both non-intuitive extensions of the metalworking process, taking a long time to first invent and then develop. Once they could generate that heat and had developed the technique of ironworking, though, the sheer abundance of iron brought advantages to those who adopted it. Tracing those advantages will be part of our journey in Season 2 of the podcast, which I can now proudly announce will be beginning soon. Ish. Next episode, we're going to wrap up with a big long look at the Iron Bronze Age as a whole uh, and It'll be a really long episode. It's going to be great. It's partly meant as a summary episode for people who want a thousand-foot overview of the entire period without listening to an entire hundred and whatever episodes, but hopefully even show veterans will appreciate stepping back and looking at the grand sweep of history in a single episode to get a little perspective. And after that... We'll open up with the transition of Babylon into the second Isin dynasty as we open up on the Great Age of Empires, the Mesopotamian Iron Age. And I am happier than I can express that so many people are picking up this show and are enjoying it. And I just ask, 
if you've made it all the way through this hour-long, awful episode about boring metals, I just ask that you share this show with other people by posting it on social media, by leaving reviews or comments on YouTube or podcast app or wherever, or just by telling people who you know about the Oldest Stories podcast. As always, thank you for listening.